The blessing to welcome on one of the top mid-major prospects in the entire country and now one of the top projected players to win player of the year in his conference, Jalen Pickett. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you, sir? Pretty good. Well, you've had a lot of craziness going on because of COVID, because of this offseason that you're not preparing for your junior season and what could most likely be possibly your last year heading before you head out to the NBA. Just discuss all this scenario, though. How are you preparing for this year and how excited are you to get the season started? I'm, I'm very excited to see the season start. Uh, my season got cut short from last year. And this year, I mean, we just have so much talent and hunger and a lot of new faces out there that we really want to take the next step and see them as basketball and try to get to that tournament and um, get a tournament win. Let's go all the way back. This is a long journey to get to where you're at today. You're from New York. You started to stay home, but you're playing high school basketball. You put up a big time show, started getting some offers. Take us through your high school career a little bit and what led you to become the player you become? Um, yeah, definitely. So I started high school um, at Aquarius Institute. I was there all four years. And then after I graduated, I went to Aspire, Aspire Institute. So um, at Aquarius, Aquarius is always a great school. I played football and basketball there. Um, played on great teams. I lost probably only eight games in high school through the three years I started varsity. I started as a sophomore. Um, was sectionals two times in a row. We went undefeated sophomore year and then lost. Um, in the state tournament junior year, we lost like, I think it was like three games. Um, then we ended up winning sectionals. We won states, um, lost in the federations. I got MVP of states. Uh, really tough team. We played like Kevin Herter. Uh, we played Stafford Trueheart. Um, we played Chamori Ponds in the finals and we lost for like six. Or, so, I mean, we were really good there. And then, you know, going over to Spire Institute, you know, I got to play with Don Welch of Bonaventure, Caitlin McConnell, Rutgers. Um, Devon Baker of um, UNC Asheville, uh, Josh Brewers at Miami of Ohio. I mean, we were just loaded. We had just had so much talent across the board from um, top to bottom. That was coached by um, Coach Dave Brisky. He was a great coach there, too. And, you know, I had a lot of interest, and people didn't know. At that time, I was more of a wing. I was a two or three. People thought I didn't get much action at the one, so people didn't know how high I can go. And, you know, that affects your recruitment and your confidence a little bit, especially when a lot of people are getting offers. I came, I got, I got only three offers through that whole time. But I mean, I had, I mean, Bonaventure was recruiting me. Um, like I had West Virginia in my phone. Um, I just had a lot of schools just contacting me and reaching out with no, like, necessarily offers. And then I got my last, like, three offers at the end of Spire, where it was like Siena, St. Peter's, um, Canisius. So three schools in my conference. So, of course, you know, at that time, I picked the one that best suited me. Um, he just had really good guards, so I didn't know how much playing time I was going to get there. Um, I just didn't really like St. Peter's facilities. And then, you know, seeing it was just a perfect fit for me um, with the coach coming in and the style they wanted to play and playing time. So through that whole process, I just learned that you got to keep working hard and, you know, have a good have a good structure and believe there's a plan for you. And, you know, talking with my family and different things and just – keeping my head on straight and knowing everything's going to work out and working hard. Um, I knew my time would come eventually and I'll have the right break. I want to get into this because we see some guys like yourself fall into the radar and I'm going low and mid major. And the stories are countless out there of guys that come to the NBA, become superstars, or just even make the NBA. That's the route you've kind of taken. Now you're at Siena. You're a great player. We see NBA interest in you, but you as a recruit, why would you say that college offers weren't coming? Even though we see what you are now, what went into the recruiting process and why were you still slept on? Um, I just think at that time, I just think at that time, you know, I wasn't in the position I am. I mean, I didn't have the ball in my hands a whole lot, you know, um, playing, playing EYBL, playing eight, uh, playing high school or different situations. I was um, mainly a two, a spot up shooter. Um, I always made the right play. I wasn't flashy in that, you know, and the thing about it is at those levels, even the EYBL, I enjoyed it all the time because I still played a lot mm-hmm. and I had a couple of really good games, even playing on different positions. But those guys, you know, I made people, they really jump, you know, they're athletic or they're really just like a marksman. I was more of a, I was more of a kind of do it all type of guy, but I'm only like six, four. So it was a little different. So, I mean, that's probably why I was slept on a little bit, but, you know, definitely, definitely I knew my time was coming, you know, and that's what kind of gives me that motivation now because I played against those guys. Like I played against Cam Reddish and I played against Tyler Hero, Mo Bamba, like Isaiah Stewart was on my team. Like Nazia Carrera, Washington, Buddy Bohan, Joe, Joe 
um, Gerard, they're at Syracuse. Mike is at Cincinnati. Like, the list goes on and on. Nathan's at Buffalo. So, like, I see all these high major guys, and I've played against them, and I competed and played very well against these guys. That's what gives me the motivation to keep going because I know I can play at that level. So when I see other people, you know, going to the NBA or getting high dress, like I'm like, oh my God, like I know I can do it because these, I've played against such and such. I've beat such and such. I've played very well against these guys. And I think that's what kind of drives me to it because I kind of want my name out there. I kind of want to do this. I love basketball. I just want to keep getting better. When did you kind of make the move to point guard and know that that was the right position for you? Um. Well, okay. So my junior year of high school, I played with, um, we all played football. Everybody, when we won the state championship, we all played football. So I was kind of the point guard on that team, but the offense we ran, it was kind of four out, one in, mm-hmm. dribble drive. So kind of everybody, whoever like got the rebound brought it up. So I was kind of the point guard, but I kind of wasn't, but I kind of liked it then. So, I mean, then when we got to Siena, um, I was recruited as a two, a two and a three to shoot it. And then our point guard and the scrimmages, like preseason, this before anybody even knew, uh, Khalil Richards, really great guard. Um, he ended up messing up his knee and was out for the season. So then um, Coach Christian basically came to me and was watching film. We tried a couple other people, and he was like, dude, if you if we want anybody to win, like the couple of plays you made off the ball screen are really good. If you let us work with you, we'll make you into a, a really good point guard. Like, let us work with you, and you put in the work. So I was like, okay. I was like, I love putting in the work. I love basketball. I love the time. So I just got in countless hours watching film after practice, um, just working on my ball handling real quick and a different couple passes and reads and just watching countless of film right before, like, this was just the practice stuff, just reading the practice read because I knew first game we had Providence. So, I mean, I had to be ready. You know, for me, that's a Big East team. I had to be ready. And, you know, I went out there my first game, and I, I played pretty well. I had seven points. I had um, nine assists, I think, one turnover. But, I mean, nine assists in a Big East game with Santa. I mean, first game at point at legit point guard, like every play of the ball in my hand, I'm making a read. You know, it, it was pretty interesting. And it, it gave me the right confidence I needed to keep going. Oftentimes with the guys that are more slept on, it does just take one thing. And obviously no one wants injuries to happen, but clearly that's what helped propel your career. And we see that in all different kinds of sports. When that injury goes down, you coach talks about that move to point guard. What originally goes through your mind? Um, what originally through my mind is I didn't really want to do it. Um, I love the offense where we came in running first and you know, I was in a lot of open shots. Um, we actually had a scrimmage against UMass and I was shooting the ball very well at the beginning of the scrimmage. Um, I love just catching it, shooting it at the time. And then, you know, what went through my mind there was I was a little nervous because I was like, the weight of the team is now, like, on my shoulders. It was like a freshman. No idea what's going on. I've never played in the game. I didn't know how, like, good we were. And, I mean, we just – we were and we were winning the scrimmage at UMass. So, we were supposed to be a pretty good team, like, with what we had. So, now it's like – now it's like I got all on my shoulder and now I got pressure on myself. Just because it's like everybody sees how good we can be, I can't like mess this up, you know. And you get that, and it's just hard for any freshman, no matter what level, where you're playing, to come in and lead a team full of guys that have sophomore, junior, senior guys, especially running a new position. How'd you shake off the nerves and just be able to play your basketball at such a high level? Um, I really want to credit that to um, the older guys on my team, the seniors. Um, they did a great job of just saying, Hey, man, we're gonna go in and we're gonna be behind you 110% of the time. And I want to put, I want to give the coaches another great credit, um, Coach Carm, Coach Christian, um, and especially Graham Bowsley, who just sat in the office with me for a while, and Harley Fuller, who really worked with me too. Um, those guys really just told me, like, the reads. And then when I messed up, you know, they picked me up. And then, you know, they gave me tough love when I really needed it. But, I mean, it was just a great – I had a great support system around me. And then I think one thing internally that kept me going is I love basketball. Everybody makes mistakes in basketball. And I think the best part about making mistakes is when you fail, um, you learn. You learn from failing. Everybody learns from failing. So when you mess something up, you know, okay, I can't, I can't do that again. Or I can't do it that slow. Or I can't do it that fast. Like, I got to wait. I got to learn myself. And I got to learn the players around me. And my teammates did a great job of helping me figure that out. I want to go back to high school in the UIBL circuit for a little bit. And that is something that we're starting to see the first kind of generation of players have gone through this circuit, have gone through different EYBL ideas under armor circuits. And we see a lot of guys say that that's helped prepare them more for college and playing against the top guys, kind of know where you stand. How much did playing with City Rocks help you develop then for your college career? Um, oh my gosh, it helped me a lot. Um, basically, I can see on even, team, even teams in the MAC or every time I play, there's like at least 
at least one or two EYBL guys, at the bare minimum, one or two EYBL guys. Um, I mean, it's just great. It's just a great league. I mean, you see so many guys like I'm Marvin Bagley. I think it's Marvin Bagley on the Kings. He was on the EYBL team. So, I mean, just being able to play at that level or that high and then contribute at what I did, I mean, that shows what I can do and it builds the confidence. I mean, there's no better place. There's no better travel organization to play than, to me, than City Rock. I loved it. Um, I got friends for life. And then, you know, I got great competition every day in practice and in games. But you're at Spire. What was that you're like and how did that ultimately progress you and help you develop into your college self? Oh, um, I mean, it really helped me because, I mean, prep school, people think prep school is all fun and games. I mean, at, at my prep school, it was just, hey, it was like the basketball team, and then we, like, had a handful of swimmers, and then it was, like, a couple of track people. It was really just the people who go to the school, the 50 or so kids who went to school. And the way it helped me was just uh, preparing for the college life. I took a couple of college courses, and then just the pra- how long the practices were. Cause, I mean, you weren't going anywhere. You were there all day, every day. And then – what really helped me was how much I lifted in prep school. Like, you know, of course, you know, we lifted Tuesdays and Thursdays at Aquinas, or we lifted Monday, Wednesday, Friday at Aquinas. But every single day we lifted at prep school. And I put on, like, before the season even started, I put on, like, between 15 and 20 pounds of just muscle between literally, like, that summer and the start of the, start of the school year for prep school. And, I mean, that just got my body more physical, got me used – to the pace of play of prep school because it now it's not it's not you know a bunch of football players you're all basketball players who take basketball seriously who work on the game and it, you know you're getting the best of the best now you gotta stay home in new york what's it like playing out there and kind of having the hometown hero kind of personality um it's big for me you know i get a lot of fans um a lot of friends and a lot of family come out to the games especially the ones that we play over in buffalo um, and like Syracuse, we get a lot of I get a lot of fans and friends coming over there. So I mean, it's great, you know, just to put new, keep keeping the whole New York thing going and trying to keep putting New York on the map and show that we really have ballers out in the five eight five and over here at Siena. I mean, we get a great we get a great fan session out to um, every game at Siena, one of the top of the mid majors. So I mean, it's just great support. I love it. I'm pretty close with Coach Christian, and as you said, he's the guy that recruited you. Coach Graham and all them as well are part of that coaching staff. That freshman season, how special was learning from Coach Christian and just kind of having him under your wing and helping you develop into the player you were for your freshman season? Um, it was really special. Coach Christian's offense is a lot of ball screens, a lot of ball screen reads, um, spacing the floor and finding shooters. And, it, you know, that it, the NBA game is basically just like that today. Everybody spaces it out, shoots a lot of threes, and comes off ball screen. So, I mean, it translates well, and that's exactly what I needed. And I think now um, – with the coaches that I have now with Coach Carm, I mean, he's just taking me now to the next level. We're not doing the basics anymore. We're just going to the, you know, up in the ranks to the more advanced stuff. At what point in your freshman season was that turning point for you? And you started saying, I've really got this point guard thing down. I can go out there and start dominating. Oh, I believe my first player of the week award, my first couple of games, I mean, my first game, of course, at Providence, I had like seven and nine with like one turnover, but then I had a pretty good game at George Washington, but they weren't really good at that time. Mm -hmm. So then it was around the time we went to the Ivy Leagues came home to Siena and started playing us. It was like Harvard, uh, Yale, Colgate. Like like those those schools came. And I mean, I had, I put put together three really good games. I got played away. I think I had like 20, I was averaging like 25 and like 10 between those like three games and i'm like i'm really starting to get the hang of this i'm getting to my spots i'm shooting these shots over and over again and i'm like feeling very comfortable knocking these down because a lot of things that people got to work on is like when you come off a ball screen you got the elbow jump shot if they go under you got the under jump shot if you can turn the big and get to the brim you got the layup and then just working on the passes bounce pass overhead skip passes just repeating those cycles over and over throughout the whole season so then once i got like two months of good reps with those and I felt comfortable taking all those shots. I mean, I really took off. You average around almost 16 points a game that year, nearly seven assists, five rebounds, two steals. You really stuffed the stat sheets. When you start getting going, the team ends up having over 500 record. You guys are on a big time track for that year. When was the turning point for the entire team? When did you guys as a team start clicking and start putting together a lot of wins? Yeah. So actually, um, we had a lot of injuries in the out-of-conference season. 
Mm-hmm. Um, like Khalil got hurt, then Sammy got hurt. It was Manny's foot. It was Evans. I mean, we had a lot of injuries out of conference, but we started getting guys healthy towards our, you know, towards conference play, like the middle of conference play, like after the first three or four games. And we just started streaking them together, started putting everything together. Because, I mean, it was a whole new coaching staff. It was a lot of drama for our team. And we were projected last in our conference mm-hmm. at that time. So to be able to get to 500, I was like, oh, my God. And then once we kept winning, kept stringing along, we ended up second. So I think, like, probably three or four games in the conference. There's one game we have to touch up on. It's one game that you're the only second player in the past century to do. 45-plus points, 13-plus assists. What was that game like? And take us through how hot you got in that game. Just take us to that game. Oh, the Quinnipiac game gets Cam Young. First off, I want to say that guy really ruined that night for me. I'm not going to lie to you. Really good player. <laughs> um, we were actually losing, I think, by 20 in the first half. And then um, I actually got cussed out. Coach Christian actually cussed me out in the <laughs> locker room for not shooting the ball enough, for not being as aggressive. So, you know, I came out the second half, and I was just like, you know, if I get any opening, any window, I'm just going to shoot it. I'm just going to shoot it every time. And, you know, the first one, of course, it went in. And then the second one, you know, kept going in. Then I was getting fouled. And I'm like, I'm starting to string these together. And I started feeling, like, good and juice. And I'm like, we're coming back now. So, you know, we just kept going. And then it started getting fun. We get it to overtime. And now we get it to another overtime. And I'm like, we should definitely win this. And, you know, we ended up losing the third overtime. But it was a great back and forth. And, I mean, Cam was talking. I was talking. I mean, it was just kind of that internal fight going back between um, two players. You mentioned Coach Christian cussing you out, and that's something we hear a lot of times with the coach and the leader of the team or the star player. When he does that to you and you turn up like you did the second half, do you just have a conversation after the game about that? Oh, well, definitely. I mean, Coach Christian always wanted me to be at my best, and, you know, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate somebody trusting in me enough, and that's kind of the respect we have for each other. One of us, he even with me, you know, I would get on him some time. If he wasn't, if I felt like he wasn't doing as best as he can do, we just had that dialogue where we can go, you know, back and forth with each other and just talk to each other and get on each other. And I think that's what everybody needs with their, you know, with their coach and their player. Just that openness. You decided to declare for the draft following that season. What led you to think that that was the right time for you to declare and test the waters? Um, well, you know, that's like what I'm saying. When I have a good group, you know, um, I talk to my coaches, my family, and then I talk to, of course, Jim Hart, who's seen like a lot of who's had a lot of NBA players from AAU and seen them go through college and where I stand. And he was like, you know, you get three times to do it and you got a great season and you've played great against high major, mid major and low major basketball. I mean, there would be no better time. You know, you're hot right now. You might as well go right into it. Mm-hmm. And you go ahead and do the G League workout. You get some pre draft workouts. What are they telling you you need to work on, improve on for you ultimately to come back eventually and get drafted? Um, at that time, I needed to get more consistent on my um, catching and shooting, my three-pointer, my range. Um, they said I shot it pretty well off the dribble, but I needed to definitely get better at that. And then being um, lower to the ground, work on one-foot finishes and different things like that. And you come back, and it comes to a situation where Coach Christian goes out to GW along with a lot of the coaches, and you have a new coaching staff come in. What's your thoughts on that? I know a lot of guys, when the coaching change happens, some looking to possibly transferring out different options. Why do you want to stay committed to the program? Um, well, I've already, I had a relationship prior to Coach Crime. Um, he actually recruited me when he was at GW, mm-hmm. like during UIBL and of course, and of course Harley was already on the staff. So Harley got bumped up to an, an assistant coach. So um, just staying with those guys and talking to me. And of course, you know, Coach Christian went down, um, down South to GW and I wanted to stay somewhere local, some of my family and friends could watch the game. So, I mean, everything kind of worked out at that point. Um, of what I wanted to say. I can imagine if you wanted to open yourself up coming up the year you did, knowing that you're kind of a borderline prospect at that time, a lot of high majors would have looked into you, a lot of mid-majors, bigger schools. Was that something you ever considered? Did you ever consider looking at bigger schools opportunities? Um, definitely. You know, you always consider it. And, you know, um, I mean, I definitely look at it all the time, you know, and see, like, different people. Like, we just had somebody transfer from our school now, Don Carey. He was our two guard last year. And of course, he went to Georgetown. Uh, Rich Kelly left Quinnipiac in our league and went to Boston College. Frederick Scott went to, is also at Boston College. Ray Salmon is at DePaul. So, I mean, like people leave the league all the time and go high major. But, you know, I'm at a good place here and we got another really good group. And, you know, I'm trying to do something special here. And I respect that because a lot of guys, knowing it's a high school world, real well, 
a lot of guys start realizing you can go to the mid-majors and still make the NBA. We see countless years about guys playing at a high level, making the NBA. And that's something that you stay staying there. You could have went high major. You stay here, build a legacy for yourself. You develop and really be the dominant guy. How excited are you for this upcoming season? Um, I'm really, I'm really excited. Like I said, we got a lot of new faces and, you know, we came off a 2010 season last year and we felt like we left like three or four games on the table last year that we could have won. So, I mean, I can't, I know with COVID and everything, but I can't wait to see what this team is going to do. The sky's the limit for us. Um, we got something really special in our confidence. It's gotten even better this year. So I can't wait to really attack with these guys. Last year, you guys go 20 and 10, increase that by a lot of wins. You guys did win the conference championship, but it's true, as you said it before in other interviews, it wasn't quite winning it for real. It wasn't fair. That's what your main goal is now this upcoming season. What kind of drive do you have from last year not being able to finish it up are you going to put into this season? A real drive, a real drive. I mean, our first year, you know, we were picked dead last, and then we came in second place, and we lost a tournament. We lost, like, a game before the championship, so we kind of got a little taste of what it feels like, what we need to do to win. So and then we knew next year, the next year, which was last year, that we were going to be really well. We were going to be really good, and we were picked six. So we already felt right there that we were picked low. So to get the first place by the end of the season was a marathon, and it was just what we wanted. So we wanted to cap it off right there. And, you know, we felt like that got taken away from us. Um, even though we do get like rings and the bands and the shirts for that, we didn't get that. We didn't get that experience. We didn't get that feeling. So now this year we're projected one, but we still haven't got that. We haven't got that feeling, that experience. And I think that's what's going to drive us all year to get back to that point and to finally hang that championship up and win on the stage, win the fairway. What's the biggest difference you found now between Coach Christian and Coach Carmen? Um, definitely style of play. Um, Coach Christian was more space the floor, shoot threes, um, you know, really break defense down, keep them spread out and get easy buckets. While Coach Carm is more, we're going to attack the rim. We're going to finish right at the rim. We're going to get up and we're going to pressure you on defense and, you know, force turnovers and play kind of that way. And I think that was just the difference between both of them. They're both great hard workers. Um, they both win uh, everything they do. It's just two different styles. You know, I love playing in both of them. And I think that's what kind of helped me is that they both like, you know, they both allow people to be at their best in the positions they're in. Last year, you had a little bit of number of dip, not much, but you do increase the wins by quite a bit. Did you know that's kind of what you're expecting? Maybe have the numbers dip a little bit to have more wins as a team? Well, yeah, definitely. Last year, we had more people who could do things um, with the ball. So I didn't have the ball in my hands as much, um, which is perfectly fine. If I have, don't have the ball in my hands as much, but we win more games, um, I'll do that every year. So, I mean, what, we increased our wins by, I think it was three or four. Mm -hmm. And my numbers went down by, like, what, 0. 0.4, 0. 0.5. I mean, that's fine. They went down in averages, but the shooting percentages went up. So Now you have this upcoming season, and what are you kind of looking for? You think your numbers are going to go up now, or what do you want to produce to be potentially become an NBA prospect in the following draft? Um, not really focusing on that right now, but hopefully, I mean, always you want to improve on your numbers every year. Everybody wants to improve on your numbers. So, I mean, it depends on whatever the team needs. If they need me with the ball, if they don't need me with the ball, whatever the team needs is what I'm going to do. And so last year you go through the course of the season. Obviously, you guys put together a 20-win season. You guys were red hot, 10 wins in a row, heading into the COVID shutdown. You guys were most likely going to be going to the tournament. What would you guys have been able to accomplish in that tournament? And what, what, kind of, what were kind of your guys' expectations for the season then? Um, we always talked about it. Uh, Loyola Chicago was a great team. And, you know, seeing them do it a couple years ago, you know, once you get into a tournament, you just have to be better than everybody for one day, one game. You don't have to beat them four times. It's not a series. It's not the NBA. You got to be better than them for one day, one time. And our team was a team we felt like we can get rid of where we were already hot. We were rolling with a lot of confidence. We were playing great ball, playing great ball. And we felt like we could beat anybody in that tournament. We had everything we needed. And we were going to come out there and we were just going to give it everything, every game we got. Um, but we were just going to take it one step at a time. We just had to get one win. We felt like we could keep it rolling. I want to really go into your game now. As I mentioned many times, your guys can be the NBA prospect eventually, and we've talked about many different names that have been in the same shoes you have. You're six foot four guard, a little bit over 200 pounds. Discuss how you use your size. It's kind of a big guard, big point guard today. How have you learned to use that size against other guards? Um, it actually works out pretty well because, you know, when I come off ball screens and I'm able to hold guards on my back or hold them on my side, it's easy for me to elevate onto my jump shot. So, I mean, it kind of work, works out with me very well. Um, as my freshman year, I went to the CP3 camp and he showed how he uses his body at 
six foot, how much ever he weighs. So, I mean, if I could do the same things at six four, at least in the half court that he does, I mean, the sky's the limit. I just got to keep working on it. And I love getting to my spots and just shooting over little guards. There's many different people that have high expectations for you. One reporter before said that you are the best MAAC prospect in the past decade. Hearing that, what does that mean to you? Oh, it means a lot. It means I'm working hard and people are starting to recognize. But I mean, with that being said, uh, my career is not over yet. I got two more years. Um, say I stayed for two more years. I mean, it means I just got to keep pushing because I don't want to be just one of the best MAAC guards ever. I want to be one of the best guards ever. And I think that's something I got to strive for. You go look at this upcoming season. I know all guys have the confidence, the mindset of you're the best player out there. You want to become the number one pick. You want all this. What's your mindset going out there? Do you think you're the best point guard in the country? Um, every game, I think I'm the best player. I think I'm the best player on the floor. I mean, that's just the mindset I have. I think I'm the best point guard in the country. I go out there every game, and I don't think anybody's better than me. And I just think it's the confidence I want our team to have, too. I think that we have the best one, two, three, four, five every game. I think we have the best coach. We have the best fans. And we have to go out there, and we just have to prove it every game. Prove it every day in practice. Prove it every game. That's the mindset that you got to have every single time on the floor. That's the mindset that comes with every single one of these underdog players in the NBA and college. Is that mentality that you guys have been slept on? underdog how has that past career how has it being slept on for so long helped develop your mindset and giving you that dog mentality um it just helps me work even harder because everybody has weaknesses there's no perfect basketball player there's no perfect human on the planet i think that's what helps us out is if we can force somebody to get is somebody to play in their weaknesses for us that will help us as a team that's what we have to do we just have to force somebody to play into their weaknesses and be an underdog and just show them that we're gritty, we're tough, and it's not just going to be a cakewalk over here. Like, you're going to have to come out and you're going to have to play us for a full 40 minutes or however long it goes. You're going to have to play us for a full game, and that's that's the kind of mindset we have. A lot of guys are really scoring dominant or pass dominant. Not many have both aspects to them. How do you attribute both of those? Um, I'm not a big, I'm not a big, like, numbers guy, but, you know, it's just making all the right reads every time. That's what Coach Christian said. As long as you make the right reads, everything's going to be open for you, and you're going to help us win. Um, I trust my teammates, and I see how hard my teammates work every day, so it's easy for me to give them the ball. When I see, when I see Jordan shooting 100 threes after practice, and I see Aiden shooting 100 threes before practice, that just shows me right there that these guys work on their games, and I know they can make the, those shots because I see them make those shots all the time. Uh, Manny cuts back door and dunks the ball. Like, I'm going to hit him on the back door because I know he's going to go dunk it or go get the next and one. I just see guys working, getting in the extra time. So, I mean, I trust everybody on my team. If I was an NBA GM or coach and I want to ask you what we bring to a franchise, how would you answer that? Winning. Um, I'm all about winning. Um, I've never had a losing season. I haven't come close, and I'm just trying to change everybody's culture. Or even if you have a great coach already, you know, I'm trying to keep it going. Um, I'll do whatever team needs to do, and that's just the goal. I just want to go out and win everything. How would you do that? You come in as a freshman or an NBA sense a rookie. How do you go in amongst veterans and become a leader of a locker room? Um, well, I want to come in as a, necessarily a leader. I come in with a leader mentality of the first thing. Um, if they need a leader, you know, of course, I will step into a role. But I think a leader is somebody that's coming in from the players. The players decide, like, who's the leaders, who they should follow this and that, but um, definitely just coming in and just making the right play every time, um, helping on defense, talking. Communication is a real key to winning, and I think I do that very well. I think I communicate the game and what I see very well, and I have communication with my teammates, and I think that's something I'm going to bring in to every single locker room, making sure everybody's on the same page so we can all take strides together. What players would you compare yourself to, and what parts of each one of those guys' games do you take and put into your game? Um... I try and take a lot of different things from like point guards now. Like, you know, like I watch like Chris Paul in the ball screen because I went to the, I went to his camp after freshman year and I seen all the stuff he does in the ball screens, all his craft things in the ball screen. So I try to use some of his ball screen stuff. Um, I like the Steph Curry high pick and roll ball screen stuff, the Damian Lillard high pick and roll ball screen stuff. Um, I love how Andre Dow like swipes down at the ball on defense. So I just try and take a lot of different things from a lot of different people's game and just use it to my advantage. Ultimately, you're going to want to have a legacy for yourself that you leave behind for what you achieve both on and off the court. What do you want that legacy to be, and what do you want to be remembered for for what you achieve both on and off the court? Um, the one thing I want to be remembered for most at Siena is he's a winner and he's a great person and a great teammate. Those are three things I really, I really feel that define me as a person. Um, I care about a lot of people. Um, 
I've had a great career. I win a lot. And, you know, I'm a great teammate. I treat everybody the same. Now, to wrap up, I want to ask you, what's been your favorite memory so far of your college career? My favorite memory so far of my college career? Um, well, we won the we won the trophy at um, – we just won the trophy at St. Bonaventure. We were able to hold up in the TU, and that was, like, our first, like – trophy experience right there so I think that was my best that was my best memory so far the crowd was into it and our team was into it and you know that was our first like trophy we were hanging up and you mentioned how there are a lot of people that are crowd and this year you guys are going to bubble formats how are you adjust to that not having crowds how do you plan to adjust your game to that um the game doesn't change it's still basketball um but definitely for our team it's going to be our bench has got to be that be those fans and be our bench at the same time. That's what they have to be. They have to be our cheerleaders, our, our fans, our bench. They're going to they're gonna have to push us on the court. And even then, when I go to the bench, I'm going to be the same thing for them because we're going to need that on the floor. And we're going to need that energy that you have in practice in the games. And I think that's going to be a big key because now people are like, practice how you play. So, like, when somebody does good in practice, you know, I'm always trying to pump them up, pump them up because I'm going to be that cheerleader when I'm on the bench too for them in the game because that's what they're going to need. My final thing before I let you go, give the country the three promises you're going to make. What's the three goals you have set for yourself in this upcoming season? Three promises. Um, <laughs> three promises. Uh, whew, I don't know. I'll give it everything I got. You know, we're going to win a lot of games. We're going to have a lot of fun out there. Three promises. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Well, best of luck this upcoming season. I appreciate you taking time to come on today. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, y'all's welcome on, man. God bless. You too.